Hello, I'm Andy Agathangelo, the founder of the Transparency Task Force. We are a UK-based but very international organisation. Uh, we are a certified social enterprise, which means that our focus is about making an impact that is good for society as opposed to uh, making profit. Um, our purpose, our overall purpose, is to help ensure that consumers are treated fairly by the financial industry. Our mission is to promote ongoing reform of the financial sector so that it serves society better. And our vision, which we take very seriously indeed, is to build a highly respected, and for me those two words are extremely important, a highly respected international institution that is dedicated to helping ensure that consumers are treated fairly by the financial industry. Uh, we operate um, essentially in the UK, but we have a, approaching 4,000 members now around the world. Of those, roughly 1,500 are outside the United Kingdom. Uh, what we do is we try to make the world a better place, uh, of course, in the context of the financial industry. Uh, to do that, we carry out a very broad range of uh, activities, uh, all that taking place under what we call our strategy for driving change and our strategy for driving change is all about bringing together the thinking of two groups of people on one hand there are those people who we characterize as having a sense of passion and purpose for the change that we want to see and the other group are those that we characterize as having the power and the position to make change possible and over the last six years or so, we have been finding all sorts of ways to bring together those two groups with the specific intention of bringing about regulatory and policy change that will help us to have society better served by the financial industry. We have a terrific lineup of speakers. In about 10 minutes or so, our first speaker is Mark Bishop. Uh, then we have Dominic Lindley, then Baroness Tyler of Enfield, then Yvonne Favag MP, then Ian Mitchell QC. And towards the end of the session, we have what we call the just a minute rounds, where as you'd expect, uh, speakers get just a minute to prepare and deliver their kind of key point. We have Sue Lewis, uh, Andy Candy, Richard Emery, Nigel Cairns, Philip Meadowcroft and Vicky Fobel. So we have a packed agenda. Uh, when it comes to Q and A discussion, if I can please, invite everybody to be as succinct as possible so that we can get as many people as involved in the conversation as we can. Now, I think I'm right in saying we've run more than 40 events so far this year. We've had an outstandingly busy time and I've got no idea, to be honest with you, how many events we've run in total over the last six years. It's, it's, you know, it's obviously several hundred, as well as the events in, in the UK. We've also run events in person in uh, Dublin, Amsterdam, Zurich, Brussels, Hong Kong, Singapore, Sydney, Melbourne, Washington, D.C., Boston, New York, um, and I've even spoken in, in India. And, and the reason for mentioning that international perspective is that the issue we are discussing this evening, the issue of consumer protection, truly is an international topic. It's a topic that commands respect right around the world. And frankly, there are many countries looking at what happens in the UK as being a pathfinder. Now, the UK regulatory framework, rightly or wrongly, is seen by many other countries as the one to look at if you want good ideas about how to create a fairer financial system. So not just for the UK's benefit, but also for other countries' benefit as well, it really is profoundly important that the FCA's work around this idea of a duty of care um, is done properly and, of course, is done in keeping with the law. We'll elaborate on that point in keeping with the law uh, later on during the session. I'm going to share my screen just to bring a few particular points to life. Um, before I do that, I'll just deal with a couple of housekeeping points. Uh, please do use social media. We're a not-for-profit organisation. We don't have money to throw at advertising or promotion. We really do rely on the goodwill amongst our community to get the word out about the work that we're doing. So please do use your initiative and use 
uh, use uh, Twitter to get the message out of this uh, session. Uh, our hashtag, I've just put it into the, sorry, our Twitter handle, I should say, is in the chat. It's uh, at Transparency Task Force. I'm very happy for everybody to use the chat as well. Please use it to share any thoughts you like. But of course, of course, be civilized, be constructive. Um, just moaning about problems isn't going to achieve anything in its own right. Let's, as well as identifying the problems, let's always think about what we can do to solve them as well. So we expect collegiate and civilized conduct at all times. I'm sure nobody's going to have a problem with that. Feel free, if you want to, to tell people about yourself in the chat and provide your contact details. My colleague Alexandra, who is our head of events, uh, will be circulating the chat. Um, and we will, within a day or two or three, we will also be circulating the video recording of the session. Obviously, only say what you mean to say. We won't be editing it, apart from any uh, bits we need to edit out because of gaps, etc. cetera. Um, but the session will be all made available um, on the internet for everybody to view. The first thing I want to show you, ladies and gentlemen, is this. So this is the Transparency Task Force's response to a discussion paper that the FCA introduced. Uh, our response is dated November 2018. The reason I'm talking about it is because uh, we, we, in this discussion paper, set out what we believe are some really strong arguments for a legally enforceable duty of care who's private or which has a, a very strong uh, uh, purpose, which is to, frankly, help consumers to be better treated by the financial industry when things go wrong, but also in the very, very firm belief. And I think this is a key, a key point, ladies and gentlemen. The easier it is for consumers to get compensation, redress, justice, the less likely it's going to be for the financial industry to misbehave in the first place. That's a really important point. The stronger the regulatory framework and the easier it is for people to get compensation and redress, the less likely it is that the financial industry will misbehave. That's the first thing I wanted to show you. The second thing I'm going to show you is something which really uh, elaborates on that point. Um, this is a US database called Violation Tracker. Uh, Violation Tracker is a very, very popular database. It's all about understanding the infringements being carried out against US authorities. Um, but it's also very useful to people in the UK. And very good uh, news, it's actually coming to the United Kingdom as well. And I'm going to explain why this is very, very good news. It's very good news because if you click here where it says industry totals, I hope you can just about see that, it instantly gives you a breakdown of all the fines by all the against all, all the industries since the year 2000. This database has got about 450,000 ish records. In fact, the total amount of fines is 667 billion dollars. That's against all industries. Now, I genuinely believe there's a very strong argument that says the financial services industry should be one of the least fined industries in the world. And here's my rationale for that. It's very simple. The financial sector is entirely built on the idea that it can be trusted. The word credit comes from the Latin word credere, which means belief in. The entire financial ecosystem, this man-made society built construct, the financial sector, is built on the idea that it can be trusted. To my knowledge, it's the only industry that is built on the idea that it can be uh, trusted. So my argument would be that of all the industries out there, the one that should be the least fined, the least untrustworthy, should be the financial services sector. It's not. In fact, the data tells us, not just in this database, but many other databases as well. For example, you might want to take a look at something called the Edelman Trust Barometer. The data tells us that the financial sector has a huge problem. And here is the problem we've got. Financial services is number one, the worst behaving industry in terms of fines against it, against the US authorities. And I have no reason to believe that picture will be significantly different in any other country. 
not only is the worst offender, look at the numbers, please, ladies and gentlemen, 332,924,888,663 dollars worth of fines. That's a lot of money. In fact, it's an enormous amount of money. It's almost too big to conceive how much that money is. Or putting it another way, and this is perhaps an even more profoundly powerful way of putting the point, it's as much as all of the other industries put together. Pharmaceuticals is in second place, oil and gas, motor vehicles. You can see the list yourself. If you add up all of the other industries, they all equate to, if you add them all up, they all equate to roughly the same as the financial services sector. This is why the Transparency Task Force was formed. Six years ago, we could see there was this big issue about conduct in the financial services sector, and we tried to do something about it. That's why we've taken the time and the trouble and are making the sacrifices to build an international community that's helping to focus on these issues. Here are the top 10 worst defending organizations, Bank of America, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not proud to say that um, you know, NatWest Group appears on a, a British bank, appears on a US database. That's how, uh, it, that's how transgressive it's been. Um, and we've also got, um, you know, we've also got others in there as well. Um, the most startling thing though, ladies and gentlemen, is this. Um, when you scroll down and you look at the individual cases, you see patterns. The same organizations are doing the same things wrong over and over again. And that's recidivism. Recidivism is the idea that an individual or an organization does not get cured, if I can put it that way, as a consequence of the treatment or the remedial action or the penalty imposed. This makes us very, very worried indeed, because what it suggests, ladies and gentlemen, is that these organizations treat being caught and fined as a cost of doing business. Yes, the numbers are huge. The people paying these fines are essentially the shareholders in those companies, not the executives that run them. This all points to some systemic problem with the way the financial industry is managed. And I'm going to um, jump here to this week's Transparency Times. Most of you, if you're a member, you will have received the Transparency Times today. Um, point IT, point number 18, TTS Thought for the Week says, in a lightly regulated society, the least principled people rise to the top and eventually dominate. That's a quotation by Brian Basham, one of our members, one of our ambassadors. It's a profoundly wise thing to say. I'm going to repeat it. In a lightly regulated society, the least principled people rise to the top and eventually dominate, Brian Basham. Now, good effective regulation does not necessarily mean lots of regulation. It does not necessarily mean lots of bureaucracy, lots of red tape, lots of rules. It doesn't need weak regulation. It needs good, strong, unambiguous rules that are properly enforced. We're not advocating loads of bureaucracy. We're ad advocating the need for a strong, effective regulatory framework. And we believe quite passionately that a duty of care, a proper, undiluted duty of care is the most efficient, fair, sensible, pragmatic, low cost way of achieving the kind of regulatory environment that is most likely to protect consumers from harm. I'm going to make one more point before, um, before I move to our first speaker. And that point is to re reference something in our book. Now, let me go to our book. So um, I'll put a link to our book in the chat later on. It's got lots and lots of chapters. Uh, part seven, as you can see, is all about protecting consumers from harm, protecting consumers from harm. I'm just making it a bit bigger so you can see it a bit better. We've got great contributions in that book from Adrian Tupper, from Tommy Burns, from Stefan Pagacic, from Paul Bates, um, a barrister in Canada who also practices in the UK, from Dr. Shan Turnbull, from Nicholas Morris, from Paul's Res Paul Resnick in Australia, and also from Susan Flood. This particular chapter carries an important message, which is the vital need 
for a strong regulatory fr uh, framework to protect consumers from harm. If consumers aren't protected from harm, they will incur horrible, sometimes life-changing experiences that sometimes goes far, far, far beyond just monetary loss. It can, of course, include emotional turmoil, stress, um, self-harming, suicide. It's all happened. Believe you me, it, is, it has all happened. Okay, um, I hope that sets the scene. I personally think this is most probably the most important symposium we've ever run. We are doing all we possibly can to make sure that the FCA does its job properly. I'm speaking very bluntly. Uh, the, the FCA does its job properly, uh, which we would define as doing what Parliament has asked it to do. And on that note, I'm going to pass uh, over to Mark Bishop, who's a very established uh, member of the TTF community, provides huge support to us on a purely basis. Mark is mo motivated by the same reasons I am. Him. He wants the financial industry to behave to behave itself properly. Uh, Mr. Mark Bishop, you've got 15 minutes or so. Uh, plus, we'll try and have a bit of Q and A time after that. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed, Andy, for the introduction, and thank you everybody for um, uh, for coming along. Okay. So, duty of care, the FCA's last stand, and hopefully it'll become clear as I present why I've given it that title. So the first thing is, what is a duty of care? I should stress that I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not giving you any kind of legal definition here, um, but this is a definition that is easily found by Googling it. Uh, duty of care is a requirement on party A to avoid causing reasonably foreseeable harm to party B, which if preached results in a right for party B to sue party A for losses caused. That is a duty of care. There's no ambiguity about it. There's no debate about it. That's what it is. Who are A and B? Well, in the context of financial services, thankfully, Parliament has told us what they are. It's a requirement on authorised persons to avoid causing reasonably foreseeable harm to consumers. And the terms authorised persons and consumers are defined well in financial services legislation. So again, this is not contentious. So next thing I'm going to look at here, sorry, uh, is a little bit of history. Um, if you go back to the year 2000, uh, when FISMA, as we know it, the Financial Services and Markets Act 2000 was passed, that piece of legislation contained an interesting clause. It, called, it clause was called Section 138D2, which sounds pretty dull. But actually what this, this clause basically says is, if the FCA makes a rule, and a authorised person breaches that rule, then this gives right to a right of private action. So a person, consumer who's been harmed as a result of that breach of the rule can sue. Um, there is also a right in this section uh, for the FCA to disapply, disapply this principle. And unfortunately, it has always done so. So ever since the FSA came into operation in 2003, there has always been going on in the background a fight on the part of consumer representatives to try to get a duty of care. Since then, there have been between eight and 14 consultations, depending who you believe. I suspect it's probably eight since the FCA came into being 14 in total um, about a duty of care. And at none of those times have any rules been put forward, uh, introduced about there being a duty of care. So it does feel very much like the regulator does not want this to happen. So kind of acting with all of this frustration in the background, um, the peers, when debating the Financial Services Act 2021 that's just come into law, uh, created an amendment which would oblige the FCA to consult on a duty of care and publish responses by the 1st of Jan 2022, and to make rules relating to this consultation by the 1st of August 2022. Now, they're allowed to consult on things that are an alternative to, in addition to, a duty of care. They're allowed to consult on what the duty of care might look like, how it might be phrased, but it does have to be a consultation on a duty of care. In response to this, the FCA published a consultation document on what it called its new consumer duty 
on the 14th of May 2021, and it believes that this constitutes uh, the first part of its obligation. Uh, it has published, in its view, a consultation about duty of care. Uh, what it proposes is a bold sounding new consumer duty, which at base is a set of changes or proposed changes to its principles for business. Um, we believe that these are not in their standard form a duty of care. So let me perhaps explain some of the reasons why we hold that view. So uh, a way of answering that question is perhaps to do a bit of a comparison exercise. So if we look here at, um, at what is a duty of care, um, well, a duty of care is owed by authorised persons. And that means both the firms and the individuals that are on the FCA register. The new consumer duty, well, if you read the document, sometimes they do talk about um, authorised persons, but only at the very beginning, they mostly talk about firms. So immediately what they're trying to do is cut out any liability on the part, on the part of approved persons. Um, again, why would they do that? Obviously, in the main, the approved persons don't have huge amounts of money compared to firms, but the power to go after them, I would suggest, is significant, because if they fear their net worth diminishing, they would much rather use the firm's money to pay the victims of their own wrongdoing. And to whom is the duty of care owed? Well, it's due, a duty of care is owed to consumers. But in the new consumer duty, it would probably just be customers or clients. And again, you'll see the word consumers is sometimes used, but not very often. Now, why does this matter? The thing is, it, there are many times in financial services where a consumer may be wronged by a party uh, with whom it does not have a contractual relationship. So let me just give one example. Let's say that a consumer invests in a financial services product having read a promotion. The promotion was approved by an authorised firm, but it was distributed by an unauthorised firm. The consumer is not a client or customer of the authorised firm. At the moment, that means that you can't sue. But if there were a duty of care as a consumer, you would be able to sue. Next part is what is the duty? Well, in a duty of care, it's clear, avoid causing reasonably foreseeable harm. In a new consumer duty, well, they've suggested two alternative sets of wording. One is to act in the best interests of uh, the consumer or the customer, and the other one is to achieve good outcomes for that customer. Now, interestingly, I put a little asterisk by the first of these. Uh, there was a story in the Times today suggesting that the industry is already threatening a judicial review if it is asked to act in the best interests of consumers. It takes the view that how can you know what the best interests are of a consumer? Well, of course, if you're an IFA and you've just done a really detailed fact find, then you know. Uh, but if you are, I don't know, a bank or an insurer or an investment trust or something of that sort where you're dealing with large numbers of consumers, you don't know them personally, it is a legitimate argument that you may not know what their best interests are. And that is, of course, a, a reason why the duty of care is actually a fairer thing, albeit that the industry probably would not like this to happen. Perhaps the most important thing is who would have the power to enforce the right. So under a genuine duty of care, either consumers or the FCA would have the power because these would be rules under the FCA's kind of you know, handbook. Um, and therefore, there would be the right of the FCA to go after firms, for example, by means of a restitution order. Um, but there would also be a right for consumers to sue. And actually, this matters very much for two reasons. The first reason is, if you're waiting for the FCA to issue a restitution order in your benefit, you're going to be waiting a very long time. I recently put in a Freedom of Information request to find out how many cases there have been of consumers being compensated by means of restitution order in the past five years. The FCA told me that there were three such cases. One of them, in fact, was an outright untruth. Uh, it was uh, what's known as a voluntary redress scheme. Uh, the second one, it was a partial untruth. Uh, the money had never been paid across. It took, took them eight and a half, or eight and three quarter years to actually issue a restitution order. By then, all the money was gone. Uh, the third one, about 10% of the money was the result of a restitution order and 90% a voluntary redress scheme. So uh, you'll be waiting a long time. The other reason why it's really important that consumers have the right is that I believe that this would supercharge the FCA. 
So at the moment, the FCA might rock up at a firm and say, you've caused some harm to these consumers. They've lost a load of money. Please, can you compensate them? And the firm says, actually, we'd rather not. And then the F FCA just slinks off into the shadows. You know, it's tried, but it didn't succeed. That's the end of it in most cases. Um, but actually, if the FCA could say, well, look, you're right not to fear us. You know we're a chocolate teapot. But actually, these consumers are vicious. These consumers are going to sue you. And if they sue you, not only are you going to have to pay them, you're going to pay two lots of legal fees, and everything you've done will be read out in an open court. And then we'll have no alternative but to come after you in terms of enforcement actions, prosecutions, banning you from the register, all the rest of it. So uh, this is why actually duty of care is such a powerful and valuable thing for consumers. As far as the new consumer duty is concerned, it would be a matter of waiting for the FCA to go after them in terms of restitution, which will probably never happen unless uh, a private right of action is agreed alongside the duty of uh, the new consumer duty, which to be fair to the FCA, there is one section of the consultation that proposes. And of course, it's absolutely vital that everybody responding says that there must be a private right of action. So uh, here's an interesting thing. Um, is the new consumer duty paper misleading? Well, uh, there is in there a passage which I will read you about what is a duty of care. It says, what constitutes a duty of care may have different meanings, and our existing rules already create different duties of care for firms. Well, actually, it does only have one meaning, not different meanings, and the existing rules do not create any kind of duties of care for firms. The generally accepted legal meaning of a duty of care is not an obligation to exercise reasonable skill and care when providing a product or service. It's about the avoidance of harms. Um, and this is, for example, reflected in principle two, it says, about uh, exercising due skill, care and diligence. Well, actually, the FCA's principles are just an encoding of its rules, uh, and its rules are not a duty of care because they are not legally actionable by the party harmed by any breach. And then finally, you've got this passage here. This is the only bit of this passage that isn't really a kind of straight up lie. It says section 49 of the Consumer Rights Act 2015 implies into every contract for a trader supplying service to consumer, a term saying that the trader must perform the service with reasonable care and skill. This is true, unless there are terms in the contract that try to limit liability. Uh, and also it's true if the consumer is a customer. If the consumer is not a customer, that doesn't apply. So it's not a duty of care. So the question then is, why is the FCA opposed to a duty of care? Surely a statutory regulator that has a duty to protect consumers and ensure there is fantastic competition that gives consumers lots of choice, that kind of regulator would surely like consumers to have this extra right. Well, you'd have to ask the FCA why it doesn't like a duty of care, uh, but it does seem to me a possible explanation is that such a power would actually empower consumers to bypass the regulator. It actually feels very much like the FCA is protecting the industry from consumers, the opposite of what it was established to do. It really is not a good look. And certainly when you look at the FCA consultation, it does feel to me like a classic bait and switch. You know, there's this really hard sell for a very attractive sounding uh, regulatory rather than legal solution. There's nice pyramid diagrams and cross-cutting solutions and all the rest of it. It sounds like it's, you know, really the FCA is doing a fantastic job, but actually all of it, uh, is in the gift of the FCA whether or not it will act as a result of any breaches. Uh, the organisation the FCA is stuffed with expensive lawyers, and yet it's misdirecting respondents about the meaning of a key legal term. I find it hard to believe that this is accidental. It's a statutory body that's charged with protecting consumers, and yet it's trying to deprive consumers of rights that Parliament intends them to have. This is serious stuff. Uh, very early on in this presentation, I asked the question, is this the FCA's last stand. And you probably thought he means the last stand in terms of trying to prevent there from being a duty of care. And perhaps if we win on this, then we'll have the duty of care and the FCA will start to give way on other things. I'd like to think that's true, but there is another sense in which this could be the FCA's last stand. Uh, and I'm going to give you a little bit of context to explain what this is. Uh, if you go back to last summer, specifically last July, you might re remember that the FCA issued a consultation document about proposed changes to its complaint scheme. This came in the wake of the then uh, Complaints Commissioner Anthony Townsend saying that he felt that the complaint scheme 
uh, was not satisfactory. Uh, his concern was that the FCA was operating the scheme uh, in such a way, according to rules that it had created, that in practice, consumers could not receive meaningful amounts of compensation if the FCA had let them down. And particularly if there had been regulatory failure, they could not receive any redress. The FCA decided to uh, consult on this finally after four years of being pressurized into it. Um, and it launched a, an accelerated consultation process over the summer holidays and in the middle of COVID. Um, and in, in the process of seven weeks, it very much intended to get, I suspect, very few consultation responses because it didn't start approaching consumers until very late in the day after its failure to do so had been brought to its attention. Uh, we were able to get the thing extended to the full three months. Uh, we also created a skeleton response document, which we uh, publicized amongst individual consumers and action groups and encouraged them all to use it as the basis of their response. Uh, and therefore, that hopefully there'll be a large number of consumer responses, all saying that the complaint scheme needs to do what Parliament originally intended for it, which is that it should fill the gap created by the exemption from civil liability that the FCA largely enjoys. Uh, in other words, if people had lost money because the regulator had failed, instead of going to court, they would go to this complaint scheme and they would be paid out. So that was the first thing that kind of happened that made me think, well, perhaps the FCA is getting a little bit desperate now. Uh, the next is what's happened perhaps towards the end of last year. You know that two independent reviews were published that were very critical of the FCA, uh, one about uh, London Capital and Finance and one about Connaught. Uh, and since then, the FCA has been desperately trying to avoid compensating the victims. So in LCF, we know that they're going to get some money from the Treasury. It's often presented as being 80% of their money. Actually, by the time you take into account forfeit income, it's 50% at best for most of them. Uh, so a number of them are putting complaints to the complaint scheme. And sure enough, the FCA is hiding behind the current defects of that scheme in refusing to uh, pay them redress. I should say that it has already twice or possibly even three times extended the date for which it will, um, by which it will hopefully respond to the uh, responses to the complaint scheme consultation and come up with a set of rules. So all of these uh, complaints are being dealt with under the old rules. In the Connaught case, where I'm one of the victims, it's, uh, it's going even more, it's being even bolder. It's falsely claiming that the victims are not out of pocket when they plainly are. Uh, there's also recently been a series of what I call crony hires. By crony hires, I mean hiring people who have a high profile, who are conflicted in one way or another without there being any form of open competition. So uh, we've seen the Treasury Committee criticise the FCA for hiring Megan Butler into the position of Executive Director for Transformation. Uh, and it was my Freedom of Information request that told that committee uh, that this was done without the job being advertised externally, no external headhunters involved. More recently, uh, Norsa Cadelfas, a senior FCA executive who was very much involved in the failings in the Connaught case uh, and certainly also with the IRHP redress scheme, where we expect to see an independent review very soon. She has been officially seconded to the position of chief executive of the Financial Ombudsman Service, uh, where there are problems of complaints sitting there unread for two years or more. Um, members of staff have been leaving and been made redundant. Um, that place is desperately dysfunctional. Um, and I think she's highly conflicted uh, being put into that role. Officially, it's just a secondment, but there are board minutes that show that they don't expect her back. She's uh, attended her last ever board meeting at the FCA. Then there's Raj Parker, the man who wrote the FCA's independent review into Connaught, uh, which was, uh, to put it mildly, a very gentle report. Uh, he is now an independent senior legal advisor to the FCA. Uh, and again, no job ad, no recruitment consultant, no other candidates considered for the role. Um, and really this kind of uh, backdrop, uh, which of course now includes what's gone on uh, or is going on at this minute with the, um, the consultation about duty of care, uh, does create an image, I'm sure politicians must be picking up on it by now, of a dysfunctional organisation. An organisation where, you know, if the industry uh, causes you loss, probably you'll never get compensated. If the regulator causes you loss, almost certainly you'll never get compensated. That's dysfunctional, there's something that badly wrong there. Um, so at the moment, you know, we, we see an organisation that is under attack, 
you know, feels that it's being criticised, feels that, you know, it's, it's reason to be is being doubted by politicians. And its response is not actually to knuckle down and fix the problem, but it's actually to fight the transparency and the accountability that could solve the problem. So I think, you know, it could turn out to be the FCA's last stand in a different sense than the FCA intends. Uh, so what is Transparency Task Force doing about this? Uh, at the moment, I think we're doing absolutely the right thing, which is to focus on the issue at hand. You know, what I said in my last slide is a personal opinion. You may agree or disagree with it. But what we know and is uncontroversial is that we've got a consultation to respond to. Right now, uh, Transparency Task Force is in dialogue with Charles Randall, encouraging him to reissue the consultation so it's focused on a genuine duty of care, removing all misdirection from that document. Uh, we, of course, will respond to the consultation, but we're also urging others to do so and to use our draft response, uh, which is available via a link in this presentation, which I will upload, as the basis of theirs. And the points that we really want them to include are that the duty of care should apply to all authorised persons, that the beneficiaries should be all consumers, that there should be both a pro private right of action and regulatory options available, uh, and that when they consider the responses, they must prioritise the consumer ones. What I mean by that is, if there are 50 responses from consumers and 50 from the industry, I, I would actually say the consumers should win. And the reason is the FCA has a statutory duty to protect consumers, and actually the industry is uh, saying the thing that serves its economic interests, so should be discounted. We are also briefing parliamentarians, there are a number of them on this call, but we talk to others separately from this. Um, and of course, in everything we're doing, we are paving the way for a possible judicial review or a parliamentary challenge, if it is held to be the case, as we suspect it will be, that the FCA is not really uh, in, you know, doing what it's told to do by Section 29 of the 2021 Act. It's not really consulting about a duty of care. It has probably misdirected people about what a duty of care is. Those are grounds, I suspect, uh, for there being a judicial review if the FCA is determined to push ahead next year uh, with this new consumer duty, but not a real duty of care. OK, so I've been talking for a little while. Um, I've finished now. Uh, so I'd like to hand over to everybody else for some questions. Uh, before we go there, Mark, I think you, it's very, very clear that you've spent a great deal of time and effort uh, preparing your absolutely first class uh, presentation, Mark. That was crystal clear and very well structured. Thank you for doing that. Can we all please show our appreciation to Mark for the time and effort he's put into preparing that and also for delivering it in such a first class manner. A very, very well done. Thank you ever so much. Thanks, Thanks, Thank everyone. you very, very much indeed. Um, we're going to open up for Q&A now. Please, if I can, invite everybody to be as succinct as possible and obviously be collegiate. Whether you agree or disagree, please uh, understand we're a very civilised, friendly bunch. Uh, please just wave your hand literally or uh, raise it digitally, as Pauline Creasy has just done. So, Pauline, let's see if we can. Um, not necessary. If for some reason you, oh, you can, great. Pauline, lovely to have you with us as always. Please make your point to Mark. Thank you very much indeed, Pauline Creasy. Thanks very much, Andy, and thank you very much, Mark. Uh, lovely presentation, puts it, everything in focus for us to discuss. Um, I just have a question for you, please, um, based on the fact that you've been doing this for quite a while. Do you think this is um, the, the deliberate um, uh, brainchild um, of the FCA? Because um, I think, to be fair to the FCA, they have caused us a lot of trouble as consumers, those of us that have been caught up in various frauds in the last few years. But equally, we've come across, you and I have both come across people within the FCA who seem to be trying to do their absolute best. Um, and I'm curious as to where um, this strategy is coming for on this consultation. And I wondered if you've got any ideas. And I'll just throw out what I'm kind of wondering. I'm wondering if the FCA are between a rock and a hard place, that there are actually people there that would actually like them to be a proper regulator and have a proper duty of care, but they're being prevented and the question is, where, where are they being prevented? Is this coming from the Treasury? Is this coming from industry? Is it a combination of industry pressure on the Treasury, which is kind of like where I'm at? So I'd be very interested in your view on that. Thank you. OK, well, thank you, Pauline. I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I've, I've sat in the FCA's offices before now, uh, presenting 
uh, kind of ideas about how to fix the thing. And one of the things that I've done is to show a classic two by two consultants matrix, where along the bottom, it, this is a way of analyzing staff. Along the bottom, there's capability. And across the top, there is consumer orientation. So obviously what you really want is people who are in the top right box, people who are highly capable and are very strongly oriented towards helping consumers. And the question I ask when I present this thing is what proportion of the FCA staff are in that box and how many of them are in senior positions? This is my personal opinion. It is not a TTF opinion. It's certainly not a, a proven fact, but my view is uh, most of the people in the FCA are village idiots and most of the people at the top of the FCA are high functioning sociopaths. I think the people at the top of the organization desperately want to protect the financial services industry from consumers. Um, and the people at the bottom of the organization don't really understand much of this. They just get on with their jobs and they just go home and you know, enjoy their pay at the end of the day. Um, I'm sure within the organization, there are people who desperately want to help consumers and who really are extremely capable, but I haven't seen many of them and I've certainly not seen them in high level positions within the FCA. So, you know, my, my cynical view is that the FCA has always, you know, since the, even since the FSA was created, it has had this inbuilt tension that I described in FISMA, which was that there was a parliamentary intent that there could be an actionable duty of care when the real rules were breached, but they were given a get out that enabled them to disable that right, which they exercised from the beginning. So ever since then, 2003, for 18 years, there have been these attempts by campaigners to try and get a genuine duty of care. And what they have always done in the past is said that we'll consult on it when we do our mission review, we'll consult on it, you know, in a separate document, it's so important, you know, we they always find excuses to consult on it in the future. They have a little bit been wrong footed by a bunch of parliamentarians who actually suggested, you know, an amendment to a, an act very late in the day and they got it through. So they were given an obligation to consult. That was the last thing that they wanted, you know, it sprung on them. So what they're doing is this bait and switch. What they're selling, you, they describe in perfect terms, you know, really enthusiastically as though it's the best thing since sliced bread, this new consumer duty, but they just quietly allied it as though it were really a duty of care when it isn't and they're hoping they're gonna get away with it. And if they can get away with it, then actually it is their last stand because we're never going to be able to reopen it. You know, as far as the world is concerned, we've now got a duty of care. What we've actually got is a slightly tougher sounding set of FCA principles for business. Thank you very much, Mark. That was a very clear answer. And just to, um, um, just to add to what Mark has just said, um, let me share with you my thoughts. Uh, my thoughts are that the topic of uh, regulatory capture is an issue that we have to be brave enough to talk about. So let me let me show you what I mean by this talk, this term, regulatory capture. Um, I'll put a proper kind of dictionary definition in the chat a little bit later. But regulatory capture is basically when um, the market that a regulator is regulating learns how to defend itself from that regulator and learns how to argue its case so well and so effectively that it effectively makes the regulator quite toothless. Now, I think that over decades, the financial services sector in the UK has learned how to relationship manage, let me put it that way, our financial regulators. They spend a lot of money doing this. I think that across Europe, the banks spend something like 350 million euros a year lobbying governments okay about 350 i'll try to find the accurate link to that uh, number in in a short while this um this piece in the times today banks and insurers fear a flood of new claims under title rules and they talk about fca's propo proposed consumer protection regulations could face judicial review this in my opinion is a perfect classic example of the industry saying to themselves the last thing we want is rules that would allow that would make it harder for us to carry on the way we work now we are going to push back against this so stop and think about this for a moment this headline tells us everything we need to know the regulator even in its very diluted 
quite possibly illegal watered down version, the consumer duty, even that is causing the banks and insurers to put it to the regulator. We're really unhappy about this thing. It might result in claims. We don't want that to happen. We're going to start having conversations with you about a potential judicial review. So I think what we've really got here is a struggle between two forces. The pro-consumer forces, people like us lot, essentially, and the powerful, powerful lobbying capabilities of the financial services sector, which economically is very important to the UK PLC, of course it is, and stuck in the middle is the regulator. There's some academic research suggesting that roughly, um, these are rough numbers, 90% of consultation responses come from an, the industry, only a small percentage comes from consumer groups. So if you're the regulator, nine out of 10 inputs into your organization will be about the industry arguing why there isn't a problem, nothing to see here, Gov, everything's hunky-dory, we'll carry on regulating ourselves through our trade bodies and associations, please just leave us alone. That's the dynamic that I believe is in existence and that's exactly the dynamic that Mark just, uh, just spoke to. We're going to go to Martin White. And if you do want to raise your hand or ask a question, make sure you have your first name and surname on the screen. If you're not sure how to do it, pop a note into the chat and we'll tell you how. Mr. Martin White, uh, great to have you with us. As always, sir, uh, over to you. Um, thank you, Andy. Um, I, I think the points that I want to make have more or less been touched on. Um, however, um, I feel more kindly towards the people at the FCA than most of you. I think they do care and do want to help the consumer. But I think the real problem is that their real bosses, Parliament, Treasury, don't. And I think the law that set up the Financial Conduct Authority was really set up to protect the industry, but to make it look like it was there to protect the consumer. So I think there is a deep conflict that's happened right at the top of the civil servants service, and that is government policy. Um, so I, that's the, that's the key, critical point for me. The second point I'd like to make, though, is that even with the duty of care, if you look at the preambles in, in both this document and in the document that they issued last year about um, the call for input on consumer investments, they do set out really beautifully the problem of the consumer in that um, they basically get screwed through lack of knowledge and conflicts. They put those points. And in then both, doc both documents, they, put, they do nothing to redress the problem. And as far as I'm concerned, the problem is quite simple. People need to be told the truth about expenses and they need to be told how to access things most cheaply without having to go to an IFA. And that would totally transform the world. That's my lot, thank you. Martin, thank you very much indeed. Um, great input as always, sir. Please wave at me either digitally or otherwise if you'd like to make a point. Uh, we're going to go to Sue Flood, who I can see waving away there. Sue, thank you very much indeed. Over to you. Hi, Take Mark. Good evening, morning, everybody. Um, thank you for an excellent presentation as always. Um, Having gone back on, in particular, the majority of pension scans uh, and warnings and guidance that would have been available from 2010 onwards, um, which would have explained to myself or members of the public, um, looking back on the FSA, FCA website and archived public warnings for um, any um, that might have preluded people um, to avoid uh, regulated advisors that were out of jurisdictions, uh, there weren't any warnings. Uh, I cannot find any warnings. I'm having great difficulty with that um, and wonder how that would affect present circumstances, Mark. That's an interesting question. You may just come in perhaps quickly and respond to what Sue said. Um, there is an interesting point here, which is, I think you're implying, you know, if the FCA knows about something being a risk to consumers, and it doesn't create a warning on its website, or do something else that might protect consumers, is it also at fault 
is it liable? Well, of course, what you're implying there is that there should be duty of care on the part of the FCA toward consumers. Now, I strongly agree with that idea. Um, I haven't put it in the first draft of our response document and purely for, purely for tactical reason. And that is, if we put that in there, it'll scare them off even more. But it is it's a very logical thought. You know, if the industry owes a duty of care to consumers, why doesn't the regulator own one as well? Um, and, you know, there are many cases, and certainly in you, if you look at both the LCF and Connaught external reviews, you can see literally dozens of examples of times when, you know, a reasonably competent regulator acting in good faith on the basis of the information available at the time would have closed the thing down but didn't. Indeed. In my view, that should create a civil liability. Unfortunately, politicians were persuaded back in the day that there should not be a civil liability on the part of the regulators towards consumers, except where there are very narrow carve outs, human rights breach and bad faith. Now, it may be that in one of these cases, and particularly Connaught, we may end up having to use the human rights one and going into lit litigation, but we could be five million pounds in quite easily um, and we might not win it. It is uncharted territory. Thank you, Mark. Very helpful exchange indeed. Uh, I'm going to go to Nicholas Wilson. Uh, Nicholas, as well as making the point that you're about to make, um, could you please also tell everybody about the recent developments in relation to HSBC? Very, very briefly, if you're happy to, because I think that there are many people on this Zoom meeting who'd love to know what you have managed to do over many years. So please do cover that briefly for me, Nicholas, then, then jump into your point. Thank you. OK, thanks, uh, Andy. But they're actually related um, because what's happened recently is the, the HSBC in their accounts have uh, set aside £223 million for redress on something which I first blew the whistle on in 2006 and I've been fighting for ever since. But uh, and originally the, the first press release from the FCA was £4 million, then it was £11 million and, you know, all the time I knew it was at least 200 million pounds and now it's becoming so but my point is and the two questions I have really to to Mark or any other experts is I mean what the problem I had was the FCA required me to provide the evidence now I was reporting to them with sufficient evidence because I was head of debt recovery at a firm of solicitors I had sufficient evidence to show them what had been going on but they didn't investigate it they required me to provide the evidence for this 223 million pound fraud. And I didn't have it. I, I Even though I had, uh, had been leaked to me hundreds of thousands of county court judgments, they refused to look at them because they'd been leaked to me. So my point is, I mean, I don't want to talk about my case, but my, so my two questions are, are we talking about duty of care from the financial services? Because surely that requires legislation. Or, or duty of care of the FCA. And my second question is, are the FCA going to change their behaviour anyway? They ride roughshod over the law. We change it to, to include a duty of care. Are they going to make, are they going to change their culture? I, I doubt it. So that's, that's it, really. I'll, I'll, sh I'll share my thoughts, then we'll go to Mark. Um, my, my thoughts are this. Um, there's been a very interesting development in Australia. Um, the Australians have had what's called the uh, a Royal Commission, which has taken a very forensic look at the workings of the financial services industry in Australia over several years. And that exercise has frankly resulted in the Australians learning that there's been a lot of, a lot, a great deal of malpractice, malfeasance, misconduct, mis-selling, all kinds of shenanigans going on that really shouldn't have been. As a consequence of this, one of the major reforms that Australia is introducing is a new full-time, heavy-duty, proper oversight model where the regulators are going to be kept a close eye on. And that's coming into force in Australia. It's the kind of thing we think would increase the chances of the regulators doing their job properly in the UK. My personal view is... The forces that work that cause the FCA to behave the way that it does are very, very powerful. And unless we have some proper parliamentary scrutiny, it's likely to carry on behaving exactly as it is. So unless the rules change, unless the laws change, 
unless there's proper transparency, scrutiny and oversight, accountability, it will carry on. So I think you make a very, very good point, Nicholas. Mark, let's get to your points about that and then we'll go to Dave. Forgive me, I don't yet know Dave's surname, but I'm sure he'll introduce himself properly in a moment. But Mark, what would your thoughts be on this? Um, so, yes, I think um, Nicholas has done an astonishing job over a great many years. And I remember being sat in, a, in my car in a car park in a terrible uh, thunderstorm, listening to the audio of his meeting with Andrew Bailey, uh, which was frankly an embarrassment. You know, Bailey knew that, um, that you know, Nicholas had got uh, HSBC banged to rights and, and he just refused to go and get the evidence and he wouldn't use the evidence that had come via a backdoor route. Um, I think that at the moment in this document, there is only a suggestion that there would be a duty of care of authorised persons, so firms and individuals that are on the register, towards consumers, no more and no less than that. Uh, there is not at the moment a suggestion that there would be a duty of care of the FCA toward consumers, firms, uh, authorised persons um, or whistleblowers. Um, and again, I think that there is a very strong case for there being one. Um, and I think, for example, we've got very soon uh, the APPG on uh, personal uh, banking and fairer financial services uh, call for evidence about, you know, the FCA, what do people think of that organisation? And I think that, that you, Nicholas, and other whistleblowers should certainly complete the section for whistleblowers. And you should make the point that you believe the FCA should have some kind of duty of care toward you. Um, I saw a tweet the other day, or I think you tweeted out, Nicholas, um, uh, an email from the FCA in which you'd basically said to the FCA, um, I am a whistleblower. Uh, you now have a policy of providing a kind of like a, a, a single point of contact, like a kind of a complaint manager or something to every whistleblower. Who's mine, please? And they kind of came back to you and saying, well, you know, please prove that you are a whistleblower. You know, after all of these years, which I felt that was them gaslighting you. I felt that given the stress that you've been through in this case, that was actually bullying. Mm -hmm. um, I would personally say the individual, if I, if I ran the FCA, the individual that sent that email would have been sacked for gross misconduct, because I think that that was grossly unacceptable treatment of a whistleblower. Um, and certainly I, I hope that you would... Well, as, uh, as, I as I think you know, Mark, I replied to that letter simply saying, do you know who I am? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is all you can say. It's all you can say. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, we'll go to Dave. Kick off with telling us who you are, obviously including your surname, Dave. Thank you. Um, also, I am one of Lloyd's victims. Uh, basically, I was defrauded, um, conned, ripped off, my family destroyed, my wife who worked for Lloyd's, heart attack, nervous breakdown, if she testified to the truth, Lloyd's have spent 20 billion since 2003 avoiding litigation to bring them to justice. Basically, they ride roughshod over everyone. Uh, I'm part of the Action for Justice Lloyd's Victims Unit and we are uncovering all sorts of stuff with fraud um, and lies told to MPs. Osorio gets knighthood, gets a knighthood, and the man is an out and out liar and fraud, as is Blackwell, Lupton. Cheatham is now the company, says she's the company secretary, but she can't be because Lloyd's own bylaws state you must have a duty of care and a duty of loyalty to their shareholders. Now, Blackwell lied at the 2018 AGM to his shareholders about the HBOS Reading thing. So he then became prohibited when his whole board sided with him. The FCA do nothing. They are not interested in actually prohibiting people who are in breach of Lloyd's own bylaws, company laws, everything. They just lie and they even boast about the fact that they've lied, that the, the FCA cannot force Vicky Watts, who is a nominated mediator for Black Horse Finance, turned round. The Supreme Court ruled for me on March the 11th, 20. 13, 
uh, sorry, uh, 2015. And the FCA ruled for me on the 4th of June, 2015. Just too late to save my house, but the FCA won't blanket enforce the rulings. And the, the banks know this and they play to it. And there is nothing we can do. The other thing I would like to point Dave, out Dave, I'm going to is stop you there. very, very quickly say, please don't use the word compensation. It's remediation. I had all the money I wanted. They stole it all. Thanks, I don't want compensation. I want my money back. Thanks, Dave. We'll hold it there. Dave, yeah. what, is your, what is your surname? There's a particular reason why I'm asking it, Dave. What's your surname? My name my name is Dave Brotherston. Thank you very much. Okay. Excellent. The reason, that, the reason I want to know that, apart from the normal reasons, is because I'm very pleased to say that we have some interns working with the TTF over the next few weeks. And one of the things they're going to be doing is to compile some evidence about the human cost when the financial industry misbehaves. And you're someone, Dave, that will we'll introduce you to those interns so they can come, they can talk to you and spend some time understanding your case. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's been uh, su superb so far. We're going to go to Connor very briefly, and then we're going to be moving the agenda forward. Connor, I must then please ask you to be as succinct as you can be, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm talking from Ireland, so I just want to give some context and, and a question. We've had best interests regulations in Ireland since 2006. And when consumers went to the courts to try and enforce those, the courts just said, no, you know, the contract was you signed up and you got debt or whatever else for the financial crisis. The question I have, I suppose, is are we expecting the, F the, the conduct authorities to take on this best uh, interest approach, yet they're also going to enforce it? So the question is, who's the ultimate arbiter of that? And are, there, are we expecting an awful lot of the regulators, but also then not expecting anything at all in terms of their ability to enforce this? And that's the question I'd have in terms of it's been in Ireland for almost 20 years now, but it hasn't really served customers at all. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, Connor, I'm so grateful for you to take time to make that point because we need to know about that Irish experience. Whatever's gone wrong in Ireland, we need to make sure it doesn't go wrong in the UK. So, Connor, I'll invite my colleague Alexandra to liaise with you, please, to fix up the conversation. Uh, me, you, Mark Bishop, just to chat that through. Let's learn from what's happened in, in Ireland and let's hopefully help prevent it from happening in the UK as well. Uh, ladies and gents, we're going to move forward with our, uh, with our session. Our next speaker is Dominic Lindley. Before we move to Dominic, let's put our hands together uh, warmly to, to show our appreciation for Mark's session, which I thought was first class. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Mark Bishop. That really was excellent. We're going to go straight now to our next speaker, Dominic Lindley. Dominic, please take an opportunity to introduce yourself and go for it, sir. Thank you very much. You've got roughly 10 minutes or so. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Andy. And thanks to the Transparency Task Force for inviting me to speak. So I'm Director of Policy at Think Tank New City Agenda and have various other roles. But it's important to know everything I'm going to say today represents my own opinions and not those of any of my employers. So I think, first of all, I consider myself to be something of a regulatory historian. So it's important to say that strong outcomes-based or principles-based regulation has been promised many times in the past. And this always leads to the same tensions. So in 1995, there's a tension in the desire of firms. They want vague general rules like the principles and to test the detailed rule books, but they also want certainty and detailed information of what is expected of them. And the thing about the phrase outcomes-based regulation is that it allows all stakeholders to project what they want to happen onto that phrase. So when, so when someone says outcomes-based regulation to me, I think of stronger and more proactive regulation. When someone else hears the phrase, they can think of more flexibility for small firms. Someone else might hear less box ticking and supervision. And we might never come to a shared agreement of what actually the move to outcomes-based regulation actually means. And indeed in the past, there's been swings amongst what is meant by it. So in the kind of 1980s and 90s, the Securities and Investment Board sometimes used a shift from rules to principles of a way of demonstrating that you know, their rules were meaningful and enforceable. And at other times they use the shift from rules to principles to defend against charges of over-regulation. And of course, we've been here before in terms of the FSA, where they said they had their Treating Customers Fairly initiative in 2007, where they focused on giving the requirement to treat retail customers fairly renewed emphasis. And they wanted to see a step change in the behavior of the financial services sector 
and deliver improved outcomes for retail consumers. And it set a series of deadlines, um, but then of course the financial crisis intervened and the specific deadlines were dropped. And if you do want to read more about the history, then very much of it, or well, certainly up to 2016, is covered in the New City Agenda report on the culture of the financial regulators. And I think learning from history is very important. So if I were the FCA, I would start with a clear idea of why previous attempts to move to outcomes-based regulation hadn't quite had the desired impact of reducing harm. And as the New City Agenda report recognised, proper evaluation is always very important. But when it comes to financial regulation, we only really seem to get that when an independent review is commissioned. And these only come after major failings. So you have a major failing, you have an independent review, then you have a big reorganisation of, um, of the regulator, whereas actually evaluation and independent review needs to be built into business as usual. But let's turn to the consultation and let's start with some good points from the consultation, because there are some good points. They acknowledge the harm that's occurring in the market. Uh, this includes harm occurring in sectors where consumer inertia is exploited. And they also recognize that harms can become entrenched in particular sectors and require intervention. And it's, you know, it's very much a welcome change from PPI in 2005, where I think the FSA said that the quick, simplest, quickest, and most effective way forward was that the industry could decide to improve its own standards and move decisively towards putting in place the elements of a considerably more competitive market. So just assuming that you know, they could leave it and the industry would just decide to fix itself, which of course didn't happen. And they also acknowledge the importance of protect prevention. I think too much of the past 20 years has been spent waiting for the harm to occur. And then even afterwards, not cleaning it up properly afterwards or taking far too long to get people to dress. So you know, it is welcome that they're saying the consumer duty is intended to, and in fact does set a higher standard of care and expectation beyond our current set of rules and principles. And it's also welcome that there will be a slightly broader scope to the consumer duty, although it covers retail clients, which includes SMEs. But I think it also needs to be expanded to cover sort of potential clients uh, on people who are thinking about buying a product but then don't. And there's also some good work on information disclosure. And you know, here, new technology does give us an opportunity. I mean, previously, when we bought a financial product, we got sent the information in the, in the post. And, you know, it was left unsaid about whether we actually kind of read and understood it. But, you know, now we get the information online. And, you know, in some cases, the firm knows we haven't read and understood it because we haven't even opened it. And, you know, so there, are, there is new opportunity there. And I think it's also good that one of the four outcomes set by the FCA is that the price of products and services should represent fair value for consumers. You know, this is a big improvement over treating customers fairly was where, where I was constantly told that it didn't cover the pricing of products and the FSA removed the rules around excessive charges because it could not ever see them being used. So I used to spend a lot of time in meetings with the FSA back in 2006, 2007 and 2008 with them explaining to me that as long as the pension company prompted someone to shop around for annuities, then offering them an annuity, you know, 15 or 20 percent off the market best wasn't treating people unfairly, whereas I viewed it as basically take the pension firm taking you know, years of pension contributions out to the street and burning them and prompting consumers to shop around was all well and good but actually competition was never going to work to help most vulnerable get fair value so i think that's good although exactly how they apply that new outcome will remain to be seen so i think that's the other lesson from treating customers fairly while the list of outcomes is important the fca will have to be far more robust and set the outcomes which it expects and we also have to get far better at measuring and reporting what outcomes are happening in the market and indeed what impact is being achieved by the FCA's own regulation. I mean, over the past 20 years, the FSA and the FCA have made several attempts at developing performance frameworks and measuring outcomes. So I'm sure some of you remember the FSA's outcomes performance report from 2006, the FCA's key success measures and the draft performance framework from the 2012 publication Journey to the FCA. And I think what tends to happen is that these attempts really don't attract sufficient long-term focus from FCA senior management, and they inevitably wither and are then reinvented in a kind of constant cycle of transformation. So, you know, putting a legislative requirement for the FCA to define, measure and report on outcomes may be the only way of getting the regulators to focus on this consistently for a long enough period to enable parliament and stakeholders to hold the FCA to account for its performance. And I think the other thing I think missing from the consultation is it'd be good if the FCA provided a few examples of where if there had been this new consumer duty in place, then it would have led to a change of behavior by firms and the regulator. 
I mean, after all, if the introduction of this new consumer duty is going to have the transformer, transformative impact, which they say, then these examples should be quite easy to come up with. So two other room for improvements. I mean, in terms of what's missing from the outcomes, I would have liked to have seen something more about redress. I think a private right of action could help here, and I'll come back to that later. And finally, I really don't like the phrase reasonable expectations of consumers where the FCA, what the firm needs says, what the firm needs to do to comply with the consumer duty will vary depending on what a reasonable consumer would expect. And I think this seems to reintroduce issues around the phrase policyholders reasonable expectations, which of course caused so much damage around the Expo Life scandal. So if this phrase remains, I predict that in five years, I will be told, I will be being told by someone that the problem was that consumers had unrealistic or unreasonable expectations and therefore you know, nothing needed to be done to comply with the uh, new consumer duty. So again, just removing or clarifying that phrase would kind of prevent um, you know, a repeat of poor practice like the equitable life scandal. So in terms of the two options in the paper, which you know, Mark has covered, I prefer option two, a firm must act in the best interests of retail clients. I think it's more proactive I think option one of a firm must act to deliver good outcomes for retail clients just risks firms kind of sitting down and justifying why their customers already have a good outcome and why they don't need to do anything. So I prefer the best interest formulation. And moving on to the private right of action, because I think the other thing that's missing, you know, is a real consideration of what incentives they're going to be to comply with the new duty and how we're going to sharpen those incentives. You know, if you think about what factors currently influence the behavior of people in firms and, you know, who could act to prevent harm, you know, you have issues about how they're rewarded, the potential loss and career risk if they preside over financial harm, you know, they don't set their kind of standards in a vacuum. So you've got competitive pressure, you know, what are their competitors doing? What do they need to do to keep up? You've got peer pressure, you've got self-image, and of course, you've got the regulatory environment. And I really think we don't know enough about what acts as an effective deterrent or what could prevent uh, consumer harm. You know, the FCA do say they want senior managers to think creatively, but if they're going to do that, then we're going to need to strengthen the incentives. I mean, I often think about how a vicar might get their congregation to behave better. And I think, you know, giving sermons and rewriting the Bible would only get so far. I mean, you have to do something more. And I think when it comes to financial regulation, you need to be more proactive and set the right incentives. So I think that's why the FCA needs to be more specific about the outcomes. And as I said, for the Treating Customers Fairly Initiative, too much freedom was delegated, delegated to senior management to set and monitor the outcomes received by consumers without putting in place the right incentives. So that's why I think the private right of action is one of the most important parts of the consultation. And I hope the FCA have an open mind about it and that all of you will support it. And I think importantly, a private right of action would enable the regulators to order a redress scheme if there is a breach of the consumer duty. The FDA has got the power to order redress schemes, but it's hardly ever used it. And at the moment, it only applies for breaches of rules and not breaches of the principles. But if we're going to move away from detailed rules and towards outcomes and the broad consumer duty, then it's vital the FCA has the power to order redress schemes to breaches of the consumer duty. And I think too often, as Mark has said, where the FCA doesn't have this power, it kind of ends up negotiating redress with the industry and then imposing it on customers, whereas it should be negotiating it with customers and then imposing it on firms. And of course, there are two ways to get a private right of action. The first is getting the FCA itself to turn it on for the principles and the new duty. And of course, the second would be a small legislative change, which would remove the discretion for the regulator to set certain rules where the consumer doesn't have a, a right of action. So I think thanks very much for listening and I'll stop there and take questions, but a few key lessons, learn from experience, introduce proper independent evaluation into the FCA, into its business as usual. Let's get the regulator to agree how its approach might have been different if the new consumer duty had been in place at particular times. Make sure the work on defining outcomes is set alongside strengthening the incentive for firms to deliver the right outcomes. Make the regulator do more to report publicly on the outcomes uh, being achieved and support a new private right of action. For the new consumer duty but thanks very much for listening thanks uh, dominic thank you very much indeed um that was a very a very good session we always try to create a balanced approach to our work and, and dominic's certainly added a, a another perspective here tonight thank you very much indeed our, our next speakers are going to be baroness tyler of enfield then yvonne for varg mp then ian mitchell qc we want to get to them as quickly as we can so if there are any comments or questions can they please be as succinct as possible Wave your hand at me if you can't wait until the later Q&A session. Um, 
Mr. Krzysztof Grabowski, always lovely to have you with us all the way from Poland. Krzysztof, be nice and short and sweet for me, Krzysztof. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Good evening. I'm happy to, to, to meet you again. Uh, I am listening to the, the discussion with uh, great interest, but uh, my uh, reaction is that uh, we, uh, I, I, I can always hear FCA should do that. F FCA did not do that, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we should think what we could do, uh, because the regulators never uh, will do the good for everybody. Because the, 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 the uh, regulators want, to, if the, if they want to react, they, they want to restrict some 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 movements, some 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 some, uh, some uh, actions. Uh, but if we don't uh, uh, um, react ourselves, we don't reach the the, the result. Uh, the, 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 there was a good example that when uh, when some some shareholders uh, of, of, of the or the, the uh, board of the company reacted to, to some bad ways, mm. and we we should make the shareholders we should make the consumers uh, to to be more active. Mm. Uh, to react to, to, to the bad bad things, and then the, the, the regulators can react. Thank but you. if you yeah. wait for regulators to, 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 to do something, we do not reach the, the, the result. Christoph, thank you very much. For those of you that don't know, Christoph is a recognized international expert on corporate governance. Uh, Christoph, thank you very much. We're going to go, we're going to show our appreciation to Dominic. And then we're going to go straight to Baroness Tyler, then Field, then Yvonne Far Savage MP, then Ian Mitchell QC. I hope we're all getting a lot out of the session tonight. The input, from my point of view, is absolutely first class. Thank you very much, Mark Bishop. Thank you very much, Dominic Lindley. Thank you, everybody that's interjected with their comments and questions. Uh, let's now go to Baroness Tyler of Enfield, who's especially welcome. I, I made the point earlier that um, our strategy for driving change within the Transparency Task Force is about bringing together the thinking of those like us who have a sense of passion and purpose for the change we want to see with those like Baroness Tyler of Enfield and Yvonne Favag MP who have the power and the position to help make change possible. So Baroness Tyler, over to you, please. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Andy. Uh, can you hear me okay? Perfectly well. Great. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, it's been really interesting listening to everyone. Uh, and I've, I've learned I've learned a lot this evening. Just to say a few things about who I am. Um, I, I chaired the House of Lords um, Financial Exclusion Select Committee back in 2017. And more recently, we had a follow up uh, inquiry to see what had happened to our recommendations, one of which was all around due to, about duty of care. Um, and that was sort of led by the House of Lords Liaison Committee. Um, but we published our report from that fairly recently. And again, our, one of our headline recommendations there was still about the need for, for a duty of care. I think it's important for me to say that, you know, I'm not an expert on financial regulation. I'm not a expert on different types of duties of care. I'm a parliamentarian um, who is passionate about trying to tackle financial exclusion. So that's where that's me. And I'm also a member of the Financial Inclusion Commission. Um, and my remarks are probably going to be sort of fa fa fairly general, if, if that's OK. Um, you know, as I say, from the work that my select committee did, we thought it was really important to in introduce a requirement for the FCA to establish a statutory duty of care um, in the way that banks and other financial services um, operated towards their customers. Um, and we thought that that should replace the, you know, the, the current requirement to treat customers fairly because we just thought that was frankly insufficient. And we thought it was particularly important when we looked at the number of people in the UK who are estimated to have low financial resilience, uh, estimated at some 14.2 million, suffering either from over indebtedness, low levels of savings, low or erratic earnings, uh, and how that number had increased since, since the pandemic. 
So that's my sort of starting point. And I guess at heart, the reason we made this recommendation uh, and made it our sort of centerpiece is because we felt very strongly that that banks and other uh, financial services providers frankly needed to do more to look after their customers. They needed to be actively preventing harm and they needed to be preventing vulnerable people from being, uh, you know, cut adrift. That's, that was the reason that we sort of majored on, on, on the duty of care. And I think for me, if I really tried to express it in sort of very sort of simple words, what it was all about, it was about addressing what I feel was a major power imbalance between, you know, banks, financial service providers and their customers and the need to provide a much stronger incentive. Uh, on providers to ensure that their their products, their services uh, were designed, you know, to be fair for everyone, including the most vulnerable, who who have clearly very constrained choices, and that always were having their customers' best interests at heart. And this recommendation linked in with a range of other um, recommendations we were making. So when I looked at the consultation, I suppose you know what was my my tests were. Is this basically going to alter the balance of power? Is it going to change the behavior of firms? And is it going to promote financial inclusion? Um, And I guess we know when I first looked at it, um, the consumer duty, um, it became clear to me very early on that this is going to be sort of a very hotly contested point as to whether this consumer duty really is the sort of the duty of care that Parliament was asking for. You know, it seems to me that what consultations are asking us to do is, is, you know, look at these two concepts for a consumer principle and say that all that that is effectively the same as duty of care. And, you know, we've got these two concepts about delivering good outcomes um, or a firm acting in the best interests of, of of its clients. Now, like Dominic, you know, the best interests one would be would be my preference. Um But I think my current view, and as I say, I'm not really not a sort of a legal expert at all, is that we still need a sort of a proper duty of care, you know, which is consistent with the way that concept is usually used in common law. Um, And I think that's really what Parliament was expecting. And I do take into account the fact that there are similar duties in other sorts of professions and sectors. I think like the, you know, the legal uh, and the medical profession and how, how people in those sectors are, are meant to um, act in, in, in relation to uh, people there, people who are u- using their services. So just one or two other sort of points then about the need for a consumer. I think the need for a consumer voice is, is really strong and doesn't come out as much as I would have liked in this consultation. I mean, at the moment, the consultation says the duty would only expect firms to ask themselves what outcomes consumers should be able to expect from their products and services. Now, I mean, I think that that's, you know, it's a good start, but I don't really think it it sort of goes far enough. Um, The consultation says, in essence, we want to see firms putting themselves in in the customer's shoes, asking themselves questions such as, would I be happy to be treated in the way my firm treats its customers, or would I recommend my firm's products and services to my friends and family? Now, I think that they are important questions to ask. I think it's necessary, but I think, frankly, it's not sufficient. Um, And that's where I think listening to the voice of the consumer is really important. And I think that I really sort of think that a um, a consumer duty really worth its salt should be recommending more than just just sort of uh, looking internally. On the point about what the difference is between the consumer duty and the treating customers fairly principle, um, obviously the FCA is arguing that the consumer duty is different. Um, But in some ways, I think it's quite difficult to see what the differences actually are. Now, the FCA are, are arguing that this consumer duty will require firms to ask themselves what outcomes customers are able to expect from their products. Um, to me, this doesn't feel materially that different from the six consumer outcomes that firms should strive to achieve, you know, to, to, to ensure the fair treatment of their customers. I mean, using the words best interest, I think, is something different and new. So that's something I sort of hang on to. But again, it is unclear, I think, how this is materially different to meeting needs of consumers. 
And then I think the thing, one other thing that concerns me is that the consultation really appears to be pushing firms into providing much more information to consumers in order to rely on consumers taking more responsibility for themselves. Now, I know that this is realistic for, you know, for some, you know, for some people, but it's not really, I think, very workable for many consumers, particularly the more disadvantaged, low income vulnerable people with a whole range of vulnerabilities it might be you know mental health problems whatever um and it, so that from a financial inclusion perspective that does really worry me um you know the consultation paper has a particular focus on price and fair value well that you know of course those things are important um but i just feel that the fca has a certain type of consumer in mind there one who's fairly confident fairly financially savvy reasonably numerate um but for other consumers the people i'm particularly concerned about i think there probably do need to be stronger protections in place um and i think you know the fca have acknowledged through their financial life data that some 34% of adults have poor or low levels of numeracy particularly involving financial concepts. So all of those things sort of make me feel concerned, really, that what we've got is a rather unsatisfactory sort of halfway house. It is a step forward. I'm not entirely negative about it, but it's only, I think, a step forward. Um, and really what I would like to see myself is a more sort of anticipatory duty on firms to act in accordance with their best, their customers' best interests, something that really does rebalance that sort of bargaining position, that power base I talked about at the beginning, um, and really operating proactively to prevent poor conduct and minimise consumer harm. So that's my sort of what I would ideally want to see. I'll just end up by saying that, you know, perhaps unlike other people and the, their personal experiences we've heard tonight, I do think that generally speaking, the FCA and the people I talk to are trying to do their best. And my dealings with them are generally constructive. But I do think there's this critical issue about their, you know, what their role is in their relationship with Treasury. You know, they are a financial regulator. They're not a social policy um, body. Um, and I think that interface is, is a real problem at the moment. And that's where things, some of the things we're thinking about fall through the cracks. And that's why, uh, though this is, I'm going to end on this, it is a wider point. But our sort of other key recommendation was that the remit, the statutory remit of the FCA should be expanded so that promoting financial inclusion was it's part of its key remit. And I think if it did have that, then some of these sort of difficulties that we're talking about tonight, I just think it would be easier, frankly, for the FCA to be a bit more robust in, in what it does. I'll stop there, um, Andy. Um, recognising that other people have got very different points of view, but that's just what I wanted to input into the discussion. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so, so much. You, your, your sentiment is absolutely in line with the general views that most of us within the TTF have. It, it may well be a step in the right direction, but it doesn't go far enough. And I think the big question is whether what the FCA has done is actually in keeping with what Parliament have tasked it to do. Can we please show our appreciation to Baroness of Enfield? Thank you very much indeed, Baroness Tyler of Enfield. That was wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. And we're going to go straight to Yvonne Far for Farg MP, who's a returning parliamentarian. Yvonne, lovely to have you with us as always. Please do spend a few moments sharing your thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm Yvonne Favard. I chair the All Party Group on Debt and Personal Finance and also on Consumer Protection. And prior to that, I worked as Chief Executive of the Local Citizens Advice Bureau for 23 years. So, like Baroness Tyler, most of my life has been spent with people who are quite vulnerable and feel in vulnerable situations. And that's where I'm coming from from this. And what I looked at was really what you might almost say the opposition, the banks and the financial firms are saying about the FCA consultation. And it amazed me that they are saying that they don't feel they can act in the best interest of customers because it's vague and overly burdensome. I really do not see how any reputable financial institution or firm can say that, that they feel acting in the best interest of their clients is overly burdensome. Mm -hmm. It should be an obvious thing to do. It really should. 
I'm not an expert on the difference between duty of care and consumer duty, but I do know that duty of care does have a specific meaning that people understand. It's generally accepted to be that you have to make sure that you are acting in people's best interest. Most people understand that. And I think it's spurious to say that they won't be able to do that. I do agree that there needs to be more of a consumer voice. I think that the FCA, like Baroness Tyler, most of the time, my interaction with them has been reasonable. But as when they came in and they started to deal with the high cost lenders, they wanted to treat their customers the same way they treated people who went for a mortgage. And I'm saying this is just exactly not the, the same issue at all. They have learned from that, I think, but they need to do a little bit more to talk to the people who are actually affected by this. The private right of action, I don't disagree with. However, what we need to make certain of is that the claims management companies who are just as big a sharks as some of the others do not leap in and start making spurious claims and virtually pricing out the market on that because that would worry me we have to be careful of unintended consequences of legislation and I would not like to see another avenue for claims management companies to exploit their clients on that as well but I do think we need to make sure that everything is scrutinized properly and that there is enforcement action taken and that the FCA don't really mark their own homework on this, that it comes before Parliament, it comes before a committee. Mm -hmm. And we look, the firms are named, basically, and shamed if they are falling down on not acting in the best interest of their clients. Um, I don't think the companies will go as far as saying that they won't deal with vulnerable consumers and they won't put products forward for people who are vulnerable if this goes through, which is another thing they are threatening. I don't see that, but I think we need to be aware that that is something that's being said as well. Um, and yes, fundamentally, I agree with Baroness Tyler, the FCA should have a remit of promoting financial inclusion. It should be absolutely part of their role. And frankly, I'd like to see every government policy have a, an impact assessment on financial inclusion as well, because I think that's really important that the government policies don't go against what they're trying to do with the FCA. Um, and I think information for people, they shouldn't be relying on vast swathes of information where a lot is hidden in the footnotes. It has to be proportionate, it has to be clear, it has to be written in plain English. It has to have the main points there. Because again, like Baroness Tyler, the people I used to see at CAB didn't read the information. If they wanted to take a financial product, frankly, they would look at just a headline and, and tick anything. I've had people sign as guarantors without realizing they're doing it because they, they, they just want to get the product. So it has to be proportionate. It has to make sure that people understand the main points without hiding any of the disadvantages. But again, I'll go back. Let's push the FCA to have the remit of promoting financial inclusion. And that would save a lot of the issues here. Thank you. Thank you very, very much indeed. You make your points in a very compelling and clear way, Yvonne. We're always very appreciative. Uh, just before we jump to the individual QC, can we please show our appreciation to Yvonne for Varg MP? That was great, absolutely great. And I've never thought about the importance of adding financial inclusion into this discussion, but I can see how it's directly relevant. Okay, um, wonderful. We're now going to hear from Ian Mitchell QC, who's been a wonderful support and guide to the Transparency Task Force in many ways. Very much looking forward to what Ian's about to say. Ian Mitchell QC, over to you, sir. Thank you. Yes, hello. Um, Andy's approach uh, is that the um, consultation is not fulfilling its uh, statutory obligation. 
Um, and this derives, I, 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 this derives from a, a really a matter of terminology. Um, what do we mean by a duty of care? Now, at the co under common law, duties of care are, you know, somebody I didn't see picked up in the chat on the Donahue against Stevenson case, which is 1932, which started the whole ball rolling. Um, a duty is in tort or negligence is owed to um, the public generally uh, without there needing to be a contract. And when this normally unfolds in any kind of professional negligence context, it becomes uh, an obligation to take reasonable care not to cause harm to somebody who is in uh, your reasonable contemplation is likely to be harmed by it, by a, by a fault or negligence on your part. And that also becomes a parallel implied term in a contract that is important, unless, of course, it's expressly excluded. But of course, that then we mustn't forget that there are two separate legal channels there. Now, why this becomes important is when with the legislation talks of a duty of care, what does it mean? Um, the letter which uh, Andy, with our assistance, has written picks up on the proposition that a duty of care under a, the um, financial services legislation should equiparate to a duty of care at common law in the sense that anybody who is harmed should be able to basically sue or get a remedy for a breach of that duty. Now that leaves, of course, unanswered all the questions of what's the standard that you should um, judge the performance of the duty by. It wouldn't be much use saying the reasonably competent um, financial services provider because you know the the problem is there's a very low standard um and there's also real issues about indeed what is the duty to do is it to um look out for the best interests of the customers or is it to do something more specific so all the arguments about the detail of the consumer duty are perfectly legitimate in that context however if uh, and the argument goes, the one thing that hasn't been considered in the consultation is whether there should be a duty owed to anyone, not just somebody who is in a contract, um, for whatever the content and standard of that duty might be, um, to give them compensation should they be harmed. And we say that really is not raised in the consultation. However, if I were the bank uh, or the FCA or the financial industry, I would pick up on the, something which also worries me a little bit from what our parliamentarians are saying. And if you actually look at section 29, and I'll bore you all by just reading you a little bit from it. Um, section 29, which is the re relevant legislation, um, the Financial Conduct Authority must carry out a public consultation about whether it should make general rules providing that authorised persons owe a duty of care to consumers. And then it goes on to particularise the detail of that. Um, and you'll see that all forensically picked up in the letter. I won't take time just now with it. The problem is there seems you know, you could argue that that is ambiguous and it doesn't mean consumers generally, it means people who are consumers in a contract with um, the firm in question. So you're back to general public don't have um, a right to um, sue for a breach of duty because no duty is owed to the public generally it's owed specifically to customers of the firm. I would argue that that's not what the plain English um, of the section reads, but it is a little ambiguous. And then you would start looking at Hansard, 
to see what Parliament meant. And I noticed that, sorry, uh, the Baroness and um, Yvonne uh, Orbegu, um, MP, um, both talked about duties to their customers. And if we found that um, a Hansard was entirely the debate was, you know, there was an unspoken assumption that consumers are the customers of the people you're regulating and nobody else, it could get a bit murky very quickly. So um, I might be disinclined to be um, saying there should be a judicial review of the um, FCA's uh, consultation. But what I think is right, and this is the clever way in which the letter is focused, it says, look, there's an a priori broader question here, and that is, to whom should a duty of care be owed? You know, that's what is implicit in a duty of care. We say that it's owed to the public. Um, and then 29, um, the Senex subsection, does indeed talk about whether it should be particular sectors to whom duties are owed. So I think that what is the most effective thing to do is to very clearly publicize that there is this question to be asked and then suggest the self-evident answer from the purposes of inclusion and um, a protecting the vulnerable. And Andy's particular um, example in his letter um, is that you know this should be uh, as uh, with a tort or a, in Scotland, a delictual duty, it should be owed to whoever is harmed by it and not just exclusively customers. Um, amongst consumers, you maybe don't owe it to um, other financial institutions. So I think that's the way that um, we tend to um, go. I see Mark has put up um, a definition of consumer which might help clarify what's meant. Maybe we can look at that later. But I do think that um, we need, oh, no, that's back to the legislation which I just looked at. Um, it doesn't actually define consumer as such in that link. A oh, 1G. Okay, I'll go back to 1G. But um, the point I think is that we need to press the need to widen it to all consumers and not just consumers who are um, customers of the bank that are then of financial institution. There are then the other questions which are legitimate and which are raised. What I would like to do, however, is to suggest that really a bit of the anecdotal background to it. And that is when you um, look back a few years, there was a discussion about who should have a right to sue for breach of conduct of business source book rules. Um, and as you may know, for purely historical reasons, the rules permit individuals to sue, but don't permit companies uh, to sue. And that is slightly unfortunate because an awful lot of very, very, very small micro businesses, effectively one man businesses, conduct their work in the form of companies. And this is a point I had given evidence to Parliament on in a previous matter. And uh, I was engaged in a discussion with the then chairman of the um, Law Commission for England and Wales, I won't name him, so no names, no pat drill. Um, and he was, you know, it was a general discussion. And he said, if there were one reform you would want to see, what would it be? And I said, very specifically, um, allowing uh, companies to sue as well as individuals. And he replied to me, well, that is very funny because, um, are we, the Law Commission, had exactly the same thought quite recently, and we went to the, then of course was the Financial Services Authority, the FSA, we went to the FSA and suggested this, and the FSA um, said, well, that will never do, because if you gave everybody the right to sue, we would lose control. 
And so there is a real thought in the financial regulators, and I don't think it changed with the FCA, to say that um, a what they really want is to be able to themselves feel as though they're in control of the situation. I'm not going to speculate about their motives. They might be bad or they might be entirely good and altruistic. Who knows? But the point is, they feel that you know they are the, they, they are the people who control. They want to maintain that control. And uh, they're just not going to be ready very easily to um, surrender that control by letting anybody sue. So it's why I think that it's hugely important that the um, a present discussion um, and the response to the consultation, however technically consumer is defined, whatever parliament might have actually been amending in terms of section 29, which is why I feel a little bit dodgy about a judicial review, you know, it's the, it is the way to prize the door open and say there is a much fuller and deeper review required here there's a much broader class of people to whom duties should be owed and then using that as the trojan horse to get in so really that's i think what i'd uh, like to say now um and obviously if we have time later i'd respond to any queries but all power to andy for his um campaign i think but don't let's think there's a legal quick fix i think it's just the first shot in um establishing a proper dialogue in mitchell qc thank you very much indeed and of course everything we're doing at the ttf is very very much a team effort <clears throat> the input we've had <clears throat> from many members on this matter has been wonderful it really has been we're going to very quickly move on to our just a minute rounds to bring us back on schedule and then we'll have a general q a <clears throat> excuse me and discussion after that but before we go to our first just a minute rounder let's show our appreciation please in mitchell qc not just for his session tonight but also for his helpfulness generally around this particular consultation it's been it's been great now when we when we follow up uh, by email tomorrow one of the questions we'll put to you an invitation is simply to include yourself in the ttf's response to this consultation so uh, make sure you reply with a yes to that point if you want to be Included in, in, included in the consultation. Um, let's now go to Sue Lewis. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> and, and, and within a minute, please, within a minute, please, Sue, give us your key points. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll try, I'll try within a minute. So long, long, long time ago when dinosaurs roamed the earth and I was at the consumer panel fighting for a duty of care, I was invited to uh, do a webinar with UK Finance, um, so I went along, made my points, and then I found that UK Finance had actually fielded a senior partner in a law firm. Next 20 minutes, death by PowerPoint, he explained to me in excruciating detail why the current rules were adequate. To which I said, well, OK, Mr. Nice Expensive Suit. So why are firms still doing really bad things to consumers then? And I think the only answer to that is because the FCA is a little bit rubbish at enforcement. I mean, it's had the powers to enforce against TCF for many, many years. It almost never does so. So my kind of main point is that this is all, I, I mean, I do think we need a statutory duty. I do think we need a private right of action. I think those, but that's not what we're going to get at the moment. So the absolutely crucial issue is enforcement. I mean, it, in a way, it almost doesn't matter what the new principles say up to a point. What really matters is that the FCA enforces against them. And I think it's really important to make that point in the consultation. Thank you, thank you, Sue. Uh, beautifully put, you make very, very clear sense. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Sue. We're going to uh, thank all of our Just a Minute Round speakers collectively at the end. So we're, gonna go, we're going to go straight from Sue Lewis to Mr. Andy Candy. Uh, Andy, 
Uh, your thoughts, please, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Um, just very briefly, I um, haven't really had a chance to look at the report in detail, but um, the weasel words used by the FCA continually, um, and this was utilised very much in the interest rate hedging mis-selling, um, where you proposedly had you know, duty of care issues under the contracts you were signing with the Treasury, but it turned out the bank's Treasury, but it turned out that you didn't actually, you weren't afforded those protections within the FCA review scheme because they devised it from a point of sale and didn't deal with any of the issues uh, of how the products were introduced or enforced upon you by the commercial retail banking. So there's a big concern about the way they use the language consistently throughout to avoid any culpability whatsoever. And that's been proven under the rules that are already in place, let alone under what looked like even more watered down versions of the same thing by mixing up this use of the word consumer with client, with counterparty, all these different issues. And that, that's, you know, my overriding fear is that that just continues to happen. Um, I know you guys are doing very much a lot of work to really address that, but um, I think swaps is actually a very core issue in how this has been perpetrated on customers um, by avoiding clear breaches of the regulations and the laws by unauthorised retail managers, um, you know, by making inappropriate introductions to their treasury arm to sell you designated investment products, um, thereby avoiding these different you know, duties of care. So what's going to stop that again in future? Andy, thank you very much. Really, really interesting points about the language and the um, the kind of passing around from one part of the system to another that frankly denies people having a chance to get the justice and, and, the, and the redress that they deserve. Thank you very much indeed, Andy. We are going to keep the uh, rhythm nice and uh, snappy at this pace. Mr. Richard Emery, you're next, sir. Then we go to Nigel Cairns, then to Mr. Philip Meadowcroft. Richard. Hi there, thanks Andy. I'm coming at this from the point of view primarily concerned about individuals who are the victims of authorised push payment fraud. So that's where I'm coming from. Um, first of all, can I just deal there are three words, customer, consumer and public. Having just looked at what it says in section 1G, I don't think any of those actually encompass the people who I think need to have the right because I think it's definitely not customer. Consumer, when you read 1G, is still too narrow, but I think public is too wide. And the area that I'm really concerned about is where you have an authorised push payment fraud, the ability of the victim to challenge the beneficiary bank, because they don't currently, they're neither the customer nor the consumer in that context as I read it, but it's so often that the fraud can only happen if the beneficiary bank is hosting a fraudster's account. And I believe that the victim of the fraud should have the right to be able to challenge the beneficiary bank. However, if that right is enshrined as a right of private, a private right of action, let me point you to a case of somebody I've been helping who sued their bank for £70,000 and then, and they were suing their, their their own bank for £70,000, they persuaded the court through the appointment of a very high powered QC to throw the case out even before it came to trial and the individual has now got a £30,000 cost bill. One of the fundamental problems that I see within, the, within, this whole regular, within this whole legal environment is the problem that having a right of action is only valid if you've actually got a way of exercising that right of action. So that gives me a, a cause for concern. And then can I just say in terms of duty, if we're talking about an example of where avoiding foreseeable harm would be relevant if we'd had it years ago, we have only just now got confirmation of payee. The banks knew in 2014 that not providing confirmation of payee created foreseeable harm. That foreseeable harm is well over a billion pound of people who, if we'd had confirmation of payee, would not have lost their money. So it's an example of why we need a very, very strong duty of care, which actually very clearly says the banks must avoid doing things or not doing things where there is a foreseeable harm. 
Thank you very much, Richard. I, I noticed Ian put his hand up just then. I'm going to go to Ian because he wants to probably respond specifically to something that <laughs> Richard has just said. So, Ian, go, let's go to you, then we'll go next to Nigel Cairns. Thank you, Ian. Yes, it's a very specific response, and um, I'm grateful to Mark Bishop for giving me the handy little link to the definition of consumer that is actually used in the Act. You have to go on a bit of a paper trail to uh, get there. But when you do that, um, it's ultimately in 1G of the FSMA 2000. And um, consumer, I won't read it all to you, but the point is, it's a list of various alternatives. It's not cumulative. It's persons who A or B or C or D. Now, it doesn't have all between each of A and B and C, but you finally get to the second last one, E, and then you get the magic word or and then f in respect of whom and so when you actually read the definition certainly it covers customers but it also covers people not who who have used or may use regulated financial services or services provided by other than authorized persons but provided carrying on regulated activities and another of them who have invested or may invest in financial instruments so mm. i think there is a legal argument with that definition there specifically that it doesn't matter what the parliamentarians said in hansard just look at the statutory definition and it is wide enough to actually encompass what um, we are talking about which is a duty owed I, don't mean literally to the public, but you know, but it's a broader class than customers. So, um, a you know, there is a very strong argument uh, that which is the one we articulated, which is that we need to look at the um, uh, uh, we need to look at a duty, the a priori question of to whom is it owed, and if you want to say it's only customers, that would be a limitation of um the definition of consumer which section 29 allows them to recommend but there has to be a discussion about it so i think we still need to press home on this is not a proper discussion i think it's although i my, my, my prospects of a successful judicial review have just gone up a wee bit i'm not frightfully sure um it's one something one would wish willingly to undertake because it does require quite a lot of money and it mm. might be merely publicizing it and just getting a lot of submissions and answers in from the public saying, you know, tongue in cheek, whatever this is, this is not, uh, this, this, this is not the sort of duty that we're looking for. You haven't addressed the a priori question. We believe that that should go to all consumers, including those who aren't actually customers, but still fall in the definition of consumer. And I think it's a political and um, submission thing rather than looking for a legal remedy. Though, you know, judicial review may be possible, but I'm, I'm, any lawyer will tell you the last thing you want to do is to go off and litigate. Mm. Um, it's obviously uncertain. Ian, thank you very much indeed um, for your further input. We're going to swiftly go to Nigel, then to Philip. So, Nigel, within a minute, please, sir, if you physically can. Thank you very much, Nigel. I read the consultation paper earlier and uh, made some notes, so apologies if there's some repetition uh, from other speakers, but I'll try and rattle through it pretty quickly if I can. Uh, the FCA recognised that the current level of consumer protection is inadequate. A new consumer duty would have to enjoy the full confidence of consumers to properly address this inadequacy and in their consultation paper, the FCA seem to have recognised that fact. The FCA have, up until now, demonstrated that despite endless lessons learned and failed remedies, such as the senior managers and certification regime, there has been no effective action that has led to any improvement in firms' culture. A toothless and unsupported consumer duty would only serve to kick the can down the road one more time. Action is overdue. If the FCA continue to drag their feet, uh, they can have no standing uh, to persuade firms to resolve consumer harm in a timely manner. 
if indeed it is necessary to delay a full year as is stated to implement any new measures, then it should be made clear to firms that there is an expectation for them to observe them as soon as they are published with the expectation of compliance with immediate effect and any further persistent poor conduct being taken into future account. Any new measures must include individual as well as corporate accountability and culpability, or firms routine reoffending will without doubt continue. However, even these additional measures would be futile if, if there is a continuation of the absence of enforcement of existing regulations. The FCA must somehow remove the high level of confidence uh, that persistently offending firms have in the belief that the FCA will not intervene in any meaningful way. A duty of care would resolve the unrelenting exploitation of consumers in a straightforward way. The new consumer duty is a woolly aspiration of consumer Shangri-La that somehow rings a bit hollow. Finally, we read in today's times that banks and insurers are concerned about a deluge of litigation if stronger consumer protection rules are introduced, with some senior executives complaining to the Treasury and threatening to bring a judicial review. There is a much simpler situation. Just be honest and treat your customers fairly. Thank you, Nigel. Sheldon Mills, the FCA's Director of Consumers and Competition, we must acknowledge does not have an easy job to do. The immense power of the bankers' lobby is being brought to bear against him in advancing consumer interests, and they know where and how to apply the pressure. Tellingly, at the Treasury, so much for the FCA's independence. We can only hope that Mr Mills provide, proves to be his own man and shows the backbone to bring about a real improvement in the fortunes of the consumer. Nigel, you make some, some excellent points, you really do. Uh, you really, really do. Nigel, thank you very much. We're going to go straight to our last Just a Minute round speaker, uh, Mr. Philip Meadowcroft, sir. And there's quite a link, an overlap, I think, between tonight's discussion about duty of care at the FCA and what I think I'll be talking about tomorrow in the corporate governance uh, section uh, about a duty of candour. Um, the difference between duty of care and a duty of candour, uh, and I suspect I'm going to be... Uh, uh, corrected by Ian here, yeah. uh, so I'm ready, Ian, uh, is the obligation uh, under a duty of care to act in the best interest of the individual, and the duty of candour uh, is the obligation to keep the individual fully informed about the care, even when things go wrong. And at present, as I understand it, the duty of candour is an element of public law only, and we see this um, with uh, it, its uh, mark in healthcare services. And I'm just wondering whether a duty of candour needs to be widened from healthcare into financial services. Now, whether that's within the FCA and the regulatory side, or whether that's in the financial services providers is for another discussion. Um, but I think that uh, what the General Medical Council says on its website, um, um, and I'll just start off with the first line. Every healthcare professional must be open and honest with patients when something goes wrong with their treatment or care causes or has the potential to cause harm or distress. That means that healthcare professionals must tell the patient da -da 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 -da. I won't go on. You've got the drift of it, I think. We the have. duty of candor, I think, is uh, uh, has not been mentioned tonight. Uh, it may not be quite relevant in the context of the FCA, but uh, um, maybe Ian can shoot me down. Thank you. Well, Philip, thank you very much. I think you put a very relevant point on the table that hasn't been mentioned this evening, duty of candor as well. Thank you. We're going to go to anybody that hasn't yet had a word that they'd like to say. Then we're going to go to Sue Flood. Then we're going to go to Mark Bishop. I'd like to invite Mark to kind of bring the session to a close and add any final thoughts he has before I finally clue the, conclude the session. So before we get to Sue Flood, uh, has anybody got a point they'd like to make? Anybody that hasn't yet spoken? So please wave at me. Uh, we're going to go to Steve Farrell. Uh, thank you, Steve. Be nice and concise for me, Steve. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. I'm sorry to be, uh, be in and out of this today. I've had home things. Um, 
I still think that you're approaching this half up the argument. Unless you tackle the fact that banking is a racket, fundamentally a racket, because of its nationalisation, it's a Stalinist structure. You're not going to solve any of this stuff. It's unless you tackle that uh, and the fact that we've got rotten money and rotten banking, it's a cartel, state sanctioned cartel, you're not going to get anywhere. I've read the CP13 as well. It's drivel. The, the introduction is full of contradictions, misstatements, wild assertions and downright untruths. So you, that's not going to help you either. And unless we actually tackle this from the point of view of, say, like I've been doing for the last 35 years in my business, both on the Ten Commandments and the last six of the Ten Commandments and common law, we're not going to get anywhere. All this stuff you're talking about is just more and more of the window dressing of regular rules and written rules and all this stuff, which doesn't get you anywhere. You have to get the culture right. And that comes from free people working under property rights and rule of law, professional responsibility for IFAs and, and advisors, and covet emptor people who buy direct off banks. Unless you tackle this, this is not going to work. Thank you very much indeed for sharing your points as forthrightly as you as you always do. I always enjoy your, your comments. Thank you very much, Steve. Does anybody else have a point they'd like to say before we go to Sue Flood? Just wave at me if you do. And I can't see everybody on one screen at the same time. So bear with me while I pause here just to check. I think we're good. So let's go to Sue Flood. Then we'll go to Mark Bishop. And then uh, then I'll wrap it up um, in a few minutes time. Sue Flood, your, 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 your points, please. Thank you. Just one quick one. Um, just to enforce, uh, enforce Sue Lewis's comments regarding enforcement. It's an absolute must. I did produce for the TTF a regulated scam sheet of 150 pension scams that were conducted between 2010 to date with same name regulated advisors throughout, um, of which uh, no action was taken at all. So enforcement, I, I, I'm, I'm with Sue on that, is an absolute uh, primary objective of any. Thank you, Sue. I, and I, I, I totally agree. I mean, obviously, enforcement brings about enforcement, but it also has a multiplier effect because of the deterrent. You know, at, at the moment, becoming a scammer is a low risk, well paid job, inverted commas, because only I think it's one percent of police resources are spent on fighting fraud and those sorts of things, even though it accounts for roughly one third of all the crimes in the UK. So Indeed. enforcement has a double benefit. You, you, you're more likely to get the baddies, but you're more likely to discourage baddies from carrying on being baddies. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Let's, Thank you. Go to, let's go to Mark Bishop for his kind of roundup with his final thoughts, and then I'll bring matters to a close. Mark, over to you, sir. Okay, well, thank you, Andy. I'd like to pick up on a, a, a theme that has appeared a few times in the chat during this session, uh, and that also appears in a number of very well-intentioned responses to previous consultations on duty of care, usually submitted by, um, by charities and other organisations that represent the financially vulnerable and excluded. Um, and, and what those people have said is, um, there really is no point in having uh, an actionable duty of care because the people who most need it are the people who are financially least able to afford it. Um, and there is, of course, um, some level of, of argument that that's true, but actually it's technically not true because those who most need it can get legal aid. The people who uh, are caught in the middle, the mass affluent, for whom the cost of litigation would be life-changing, um, they're the people who really are disenfranchised. And I think that's a legitimate argument. Having said that, of course, there is also a counter argument that claims management companies uh, would come into the sector um, and, and while they are not perfect, not a, by any means the ideal solution, neither they nor litigation funders you know, are free, um, they are better than letting the bad guys get away with it. Um, so they are the least imperfect solution, I think, uh, except for one other, which was suggested by Sue Lewis. Uh, Sue said, well, and I'm sure she's, she's right, she said, you know, in a way, this um, duty of care would, you know, doesn't have to be actionable if we could be absolutely certain that the FCA would genuinely enforce in every case. And I think enforce also means go for a restitution order. Now, the problem we have uh, as respondents to this consultation is, at the moment, we have no way of making the FCA use its statutory powers. Um, and there is a complaint scheme 
but that means that we can't be compensated in situations where the regulator fails to use its statutory powers or is otherwise negligent or fails us. Um, there is no right to litigate against the FCA. Now, if all of those things were taken away, then possibly, just possibly, we might not need a private right of action and we might not need you know, claims management companies and litigation funders and all the rest of it. But you'd have to be very, very confident, I think, that the FCA really was going to use its powers. And that if it failed to use its powers, you could sue it for failing to use powers and therefore you lose the money. Um, I think that that is a very tenuous position. And that's why I think we have to keep going on both fronts. Because at the moment, as I said in my presentation, we have this appalling situation. If the industry fails you, almost certainly the industry isn't going to compensate you. If the regulator also fails you, terribly sorry, but exactly the same result. You're not going to be compensated by the FCA. So actually, the situation is, you know, private citizens who try to prepare for, you know, their future and for you know, all eventualities, you know, you will be allowed to swing. The industry and the regulator have looked after their own interests. Now, I know also in her kind of presentation or one minute slot, Sue said, well, actually, we're not going to get this actionable right uh, you know, duty of care. Um, uh, that is a possible outcome. I accept that's a possible outcome, but I think we have to fight for it. And I think we also have to fight for, you know, a complaint scheme that works or the removal of the exemption from civil liability. You know, those are reasonable rights to be expecting. Um, and I think we should be asking for them. Uh, and I'm very much um, kind of encouraged and, and sort of, you know, excited um, by what uh, Ian Mitchell said, which is, you know, taking note of that link that I provided, you know, there is a definition of consumers um, in section 29 of the 2021 Act, and it's actually taking us back to FISMA. You know, in the same uh, paragraph, there is also a definition of uh, authorised uh, persons. So we know who should be owing the duty of care to who. That's what the consultation has as its base case. Of course, the consultation could come up with a result that we don't think that these should be the right parties, you know, but as it stands, that is what the FCA should be consulting about. And it doesn't appear to be consulting about that thing. So, you know, I think we should you know, keep in mind the possibility that we may have to go to judicial review, because I think there's a lot at stake for the FCA and the industry in this. I think if we win on this, basically the FCA's superpower, which is to protect the industry from consumers, is gone, and, uh, and they don't want that. Uh, we might speculate about why they don't want that, but it does seem that they don't want it, because ever since 2003, they have disapplied the simple piece of legislation that has existed that would have allowed consumers to have a private right of action whenever an FCA rule was breached. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I personally have learned a lot from tonight's session. We've had some great speakers. We, we started off with Mark, and he's also brought the session to a close for us. We then went to Dominic Lindley. We heard from Baroness Tyler Enfield and Yvonne Favag MP, Ian Mitchell QC, and we then had short comments from Sue Lewis, Andy Candy, Richard Emery, Nigel Cairns, Philip Meadowcroft, uh, a lot of people have put a lot of effort into tonight, including, frankly, my events team headed up by Alexandra Zipkus. Uh, can we all please thank ourselves for being here, for being part of the conversation, for building the momentum that we are definitely building around the community. And remember, we got a session tomorrow night about corporate governance. And of course, so you'll get the follow-up notes from this session by Alexandra tomorrow. So thank you all very much indeed. I'm applauding you. Please support each other. We've done the best we can to bring these issues to the surface. In Mitchell QC, particular thanks to you sir, for your insight and direction and uh, guidance along the way. It's been especially helpful. Thanks all very much indeed. And Alexandra, remember please to connect us with the gentleman in Ireland because we need to learn why things didn't work out in Ireland. We need to prevent that going wrong in the UK. Whatever it was, let's understand it. And let's make sure the same thing doesn't happen in our country. Thanks all very much indeed. Have a lovely rest of your evening. Superb input from everybody. Wonderful stuff. I'll bail out now. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.